Okay, so let's start this presentation. My name is Thomas Balbosch and I'm presenting to you a joint work um, which I did with Maxime Villard. Um, it's called K-Leak. It's a practical kernel memory disclosure detection. But before going into the details, and I may warn you, this is a little bit more technical than the last talks, uh, we have to do a quick recap on two or three things. So the first thing is actually um, what is a syscall and well, um, you sh I suppose everybody knows the user space, kernel space, and user space, we've got potentially untrusted programs, and they're kind of isolated, and then there's kernel space where the kernel is running, and there's where the power lies. So the programs are isolated, and, due to, and to do anything uh, meaningful, they have to ask the kernel to do so. So they use syscalls, like for example, syscall X, which could be send a packet, or write to file, and then you call it to the kernel, um, there's a syscall dispatcher which does additional preparation, chooses the right syscall to call, and finally we turn to the user program. And the interesting thing which I'm talking about now, or later will be this boundary between user space and kernel space. There's a trust boundary. Program should not read stuff um, from kernel which they're not allowed to read and they shouldn't write there. So there's some, um, there's some data exchange um, usually going on. So um, First, some data has to go into the kernel. Um, this means um, the user program cannot write directly into the, into the kernel space. Um, so what it's going to do is the uh, user program provides a uh, pointer to a buffer, and then the kernel fetches this data and works actually on this, um, on this um, copy. Here in the slide, you can see um, there's some buffer on the a, on a user space stack, and it's get copied into the kernel stack, and some work is done. And again, there's this um, trust boundary between a user space and kernel space. And now the really interesting thing, which is this talk all about, it's um, about copy out, getting data out safely and securely out of kernel space. And typically, um, there are also dedicated functions like copy out, um, copy out string, in order to get this data um, to the user mode program. And the kernel that does not typically write directly into user space. It uses these APIs also because stuff like um, supervisor and mode access prevention. Um, so, and this kind of an exploit mitigation. So, um, and if you know what is a syscall and you know about this trust boundary, then you can follow this talk perfectly, I suppose. So, it's about kernel memory disclosures. And what are they? Well, one could say they are inadvertently writing data from kernel um, to user space. So, data that actually does not belong there but with, which was written there by accident. And as a consequence, well, first you may leak random data, but for an attacker that's useless. But then the interesting stuff can happen. For example, you may leak kernel pointers or parts of a kernel pointer. And if you've got like kernel ASLR, then um, this breaks basically your, your exploit mitigation. So, and also it can happen that you write more sensitive stuff, maybe crypto material and so on and so forth. Um, typically, those bugs do not lead directly to an um, exploitation or a privilege escalation, but they are on modern system that they've got um, kernel ASLR, um, they are t a step towards this goal. So in order to do some privilege escalation, you know, have to know where the kernel lies in memory and you need to get kernel pointers and so on and so forth. Um, so let's have a quick look how such a, a kernel memory disclosure looks in code. I, I hope everybody can read this. Um, this is a mem memory, uh, kernel memory disclosure that I found um, by auditing the FreeBSD code. Um, and on the left hand side we can see, we can see actually the code um, of the syscall. It's called syscall get context which um, provides the context, the register states to the user space program. And um, it's architecture dependent because on different architectures you've got different registers and stuff like that. And on the right hand side, that's um, the, st the, the kernel stack. We're going to call into it. There's a little um, pointer. And now we're at the beginning of this um, syscall. And what happens, we're pushing the parameters out on the stack and return to us. And still most of the stack is initialized. We don't know what's actually laying there. And now there are variables. And they're only reserved at this point in time. So the stack gets opened for the U context and also somewhere Logically, there should be the return value. And there's some sanity checking on the buffer. 
And then you go into, um, into another function, which is architecture dependent in this case, and which is called get M context, which fills this UC struct uh, with the register states. So how does this struct actually look like? Well, it's a struct, which is nested with structs. I think on another layer, layer it's also nested. So it's kind of complicated. Nobody really knows how this will be laid out into the memory by the compiler because of padding and stuff like that. So I believe nobody here in the, in the room uh, will get it right. So, so we don't know what happens usually with this stuff. So, and as a consequence, this function mgetContext fills this, um, this memory area where we pass the, the pointer, and then there, there's some hole, there's some hole. And now we're copying the whole, the whole struct to user space again. And this whole by now is the leaked stack memory. So everything that may, that was before, now is in user space. And it, in this case, in this case, it was um, two and a half kernel pointers that were passed like 20 bytes um, every time. And that's the thing with, they are like, you, you won't see it at the first look maybe, but then yeah, um, th if there was in FreeBSD kernel ASLR, it would have been broken. So um, the fix here is quite easy. Well, you just zero, zero, out, um, zero out everything before you write to it. So why are they hard to detect those um, kernel memory disclosures? Well, they are silent bugs, so they do not yield questions. Without a question, nobody usually will look into it. So maybe this is also, these are also hidden behind your C library because you usually don't talk directly with, your, with, uh, with the kernel via system call in your user land program, and maybe you won't get the leak bytes through your C library, and nobody will notice. The root of all evil here in the end is the C programming language and there's no, let's say, safe way to transfer um, data from kernel to across uh, trust boundaries. Also, the current state of compilers doesn't help. I mean, they tell you if there's a non-initial variable, but then they fail if there's a nested structs of structs and stuff like that and they don't give you um, a hint that there may be a kernel memory disclosure. Um, system memory allocators, they've got also, they're also a reason because usually the kernel stack is not um, zeroed out, it's initialized, the heap um, returns in many cases initialized memory that could be leaked to, um, to the user land. Furthermore, architectures are also a uh, thing here because um, on some architecture actually the code will leak, on the others not. This is because um, coilers, uh, compilers may add padding and so on and so forth in the structs. And you won't notice this. If you develop something on um, x86, um, it may leak on AMD64. So, and maybe some um, developers are not that aware of this issue, are not taking it seriously, but yeah. Um, typical error sources, there's a paper by um, your project, um, um, Google Project Zero, and it's like 20 pages just about um, typical problems of um, kernel memory disclosures in this paper. Um, came out like half a year ago in summer 2018. So everybody who's uh, working on low level stuff, I can definitely recommend and read it. And then afterwards you will know a lot about this um, kind of bug class. But in, in general, it boils down to stuff in the C language again. So um, in initial variables, mm, well, the compiler will warn you at least here. But then you've got um, struct alignment stuff. So um, in, um, stuff gets aligned so that you can fetch it in one CPU cycle by the compiler. Um, there may be pegging bytes at the end in structures. Um, unions are kind of evil as far as I know because um, if there are two members, a smaller one and a bigger one, then um, the union will be the size of the bigger one and if you copy out the smaller one to use the land, there will be a padding at the end. And again, there's the allocator and stack won't help here. So how to avoid it, basically, um, first, if you, if you do the stuff in general, um, passing data across trust boundary, it doesn't have to be user land, um, kernel land, can be also network, for example. Um, so local variables on the stack are usually uninitialized. We don't know what's there. And your heap implementation, if you don't pass flags, for example, it will be uninitialized as well. So Initialize it. Don't trust the compiler at the moment. I guess in a couple of years there will, there will be some advancement and they will, they will help you more on this. And don't assume any certain architecture padding when laying out stuff mentally in, 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 
in memory, so this will break your, uh, your neck. Um, and yeah, initialize your data as soon as possible. In the case, in the example that I showed you, um, if you trust that it will happen later, most likely won't happen, so do it yourself as soon as possible and you won't forget it. Um, again, again, if you, if you, um, if you writing your own uh, syscalls, then well, dump the stuff you're exchanging in user land and look for some bytes. That would be a way to another way to to, to find this leaked bytes. And finally, when in doubt, zero out because security efficiency. And when you go the long way to implement kernel ASLR, then well, one leaked byte may be enough to break it. So um, this couple of couple of cycles for sewing out data structures. Um, may help you a lot there. So what to expect actually? Um, if you um, if you look at the history of kernel memory disclosures and other operating systems, that's not an um, BSD problem. That's a problem everybody's facing at the moment. Um, like uh, in a publication of Lou in 2011, I think um, they they stated that there were around 40 kernel memory disclosures detected mostly by <coughs> manual code audits um, in the Linux kernel. And they automated stuff and found like 20 more in Android and Linux. Then there was this paper of Euro last year who found around 70 alone in Windows. So everybody's fighting with this thing. And the list goes on. There are many individual researchers that found um, memory disclosures by having a look at um, the code. So far there hasn't been any in a systematic investigation in the BSDs, as far as I know. Maybe you can say um, an exception would be um, OpenBSD manual code reviews. Um, but then again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think two weeks ago there was an, an avatar notice in o OpenBSD about the pledge call and there was a kernel memory disclosure. So if this is true, then everybody's fighting with this. So the assumption is that there must be many kernel memory disclosures in the BSD. And while I was re reviewing the code of um, FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD, um, I proved it by finding some low-hanging fruits. And then I thought, well, we could actually patch the kernel and use some form of time tracking and um, do this automatically. And this is basically where I um, teamed up with Maxime. And we came up with this idea that's called um, KLeak. So KLeak is an automatic approach to detect those um, kernel memory disclosures. And it uses a rudimentary form of um, taint tracking. So we taint um, our memory um, sources, like the kernel and the stack. Then we let the bytes, the tainted bytes, uh, travel through the kernel space. And at some data sinks, in our case, copy out, copy out string, we look at the buffers and search for certain marker bytes if they are there. And if they are there, then um, we detected such a leak. So let's have a quick look how this actually works. So we've got our program, we've got our potentially initialized stack here, and we've got our patch heap that already um, returns um, tainted, tainted um, pages. And if we use a syscall and call into, um, into the kernel at a syscall dispatcher, we taint the whole stack by um, calling a, a function of our own that, as, um, that allocates a huge, um, huge array and mem sets it with our marker byte. And then we call into the system call. Um, and the syscall will actually do memory allocations and it will get stuff from the heap. It will get, um, pay, um, it will write to the, to the stack. And um, then, at some point, um, there must be some exchange, so data gets copied out to, um, to the user space. So that would happen here, copy out to user space. And this is our basically our data um, sync, where we have a wrapper around copy out, and uh, we look at each buffer and check, well, is there a marker byte? Is, like, if there are four of them in a row, then we know, cool, there's a memory, um, kernel memory disclosure. You may, th you may think, well, one marker byte, that's, uh, that's not a good idea because um, uh, how, however uncommon a byte may be, um, you will see the bytes all, all the time. So if you think about system calls like get random, all 255 <laughs> values will be seen there. So therefore, um, we, we had um, this idea of a, of a hit map um, where we introduce basically, we introduce um, rounds 
So we, we would take the marker bytes. In the first round, we've got make marker byte one. In the second round, we've got marker byte two. And every time we encounter this marker byte in um, copy out, we notate this, uh, uh, we write this down into our hip map. And um, for example, if we say we want to check for eight rounds um, for the league, then um, we, we, um, we encode it in the hit map, eight rounds, and this decreases the possibility of false positives um, tremendously because it's very improbable that our marker bytes will be there at the same offset all the time um, in a random function. So there might still might be false positive, but it should um, decrease it uh, tremendously. So let's go into, yeah, and then again you return to user space. Let's go into um, the details. So we, we've got our data um, sources. That's um, one source is the heap. And well, we instrument basically um, the dynamic, dynamic memory allocator to re return our marked chunks. So we memset the, the chunks um, before we uh, return them. If you call malloc, for example, um, we return you uh, your pay, the, the, the memory you requested, but mem set with our marker byte and not like initialized. So um, the exception is well, um, zero chunks. If you request zero chunks, we have to return zero chunks because if we don't, you get kernel panics. Um, then uh, another, um, another source is the stack. So right before entering the score, actually. Um, it is this call this patching. Um, we call our own function that um, taints the whole stack. But then we've got a problem. During execution of the syscall, you, you enter into another function and another function, and those will open another, a local stack, will close it, there will be some data, and m maybe the leak will be a little bit deeper in the, in the, in the syscall. So what we do is we continuously retaint um, the stack. So we use some compiler instrumentation, and every now and then um, we, we retained a smaller part. I think at the moment it's 512 um, bytes. Um, we retained it, and um, this increases our pop uh, probability to encounter those tainted bytes later in the copy out. Um, and then detecting those leaks, it's like a very rudimentary taint tracking, so we don't track it, track each and every byte through the kernel, we let them travel and at the source, um, which are defined as copy out and copy out strings, um, at the strings, excuse me, um, we, uh, we check on each invocation if we see those marker values. Now you might, may ask, what are good values for marker, va uh, for marker values? So if I would mark uh, my, uh, my tainted chunks, um, heap chunks, for example, uh, with zero or 255, this is not a good choice because um, those values are probably uh, are more likely to occur. And we had this idea, well, we at least try to estimate the byte frequency first and see which ha what happens, like what bytes are more common than other bytes. Uh, that's not super scientific exact, but it, for our case, I think it was a cool approximation. Uh, what we did was we we patched um, copy out and copy out string in NetBSD8. And every time um, copy out or copy out string was called, uh, we had an internal data structure and we counted the bytes that we saw in the buffer to be copied into user space. So we counted in this buffer there were three times the byte one, two, byte, two times the byte two, and so on and so forth. And then we added another system call in order to fetch this data from kernel space and read it out. In order to get a lot of um, interaction with the operating system kernel. Um, we used um, the, um, the tests, um, test suite of NetBSD tests, ATF, and this, I think it ran in my VM half an hour, hour, something like that, and it, we uh, like it provoked many, many, many um, invocations of copy out and copy out string, and that's basically the result. So on the left-hand side, on logarithmic um, scale, you see, um, you see um, the results of copy out, and on the right hand side, you see the results of um, copy out string. So first, um, you will notice in the, in the, on the left hand side, the, the bytes like one, zero, one, that are a little bit more common. Then in the middle, that seems to be the same as the ASCII spectrum over there, more or less. Um, so those seem to be common. And then at the end, there are also like bytes like minus one, which is 255, is quite a common byte. 
Um, but bites at the end of the spectrum, like in a two range of 200, 220, um, are not that common. So maybe choosing them as marker bite would be a better idea. Then on the right hand side, we see um, the values for copy out um, string, and this copies out only um, ASCII strings. So the good news is we did not account like a byte at 200, which would be something like kernel memory disclosures. The bytes are actually in the, in the ASCII range, and there's 10 and this little spike at the left side that's like line feed and that's value 10, 10 or 11. Um, so on the bottom you can see on the left hand side the bytes that are quite common like 0, 255, I don't know why it's 1797, but um, and on the right hand side those are the bytes that are not so frequent and which we choose as our marker bytes and it's like 154, 218, Bytes like those, and I think of those ten, like four maybe are um, uh, prime numbers. So, so um, our solution, as we told you, as I told you, using only one uh, marker byte, it's not a good idea because you have a considerable amount of three positive and uh, false positives. And the solution was basically um, to invoke the kernel entry points over and over again, but changing the marker points, uh, the marker bytes, and using this. Um, hit map and with this hit map um, each offset we had a uh, we had a byte and each byte contains um, eight bits and if we choose eight rounds we switch on each round if we encounter a byte we switch a bit on and in the end um, we jump to results so this can be done in the implementation in NetBSD um, with the userland um, tool um, kleek which interacts with um, with the kernel part um, in general, it's not enabled by default, it's a developer option, but it's, uh, your system remains quite usable, so it's not a tremendous slowdown that's happening if you use KLeak. Um, and here we can see an example, we call KLeak with the number of rounds, in this case four, and the command PS. And what happens was that there came the output, and, and Maxime found this one, which was quite tremendous, which leaked 931 bytes of memory from user land um, to kernel land. So I think this was the f biggest one that we found. Um, so that's quite a lot. So quickly about the limitations. Um, well, one limitation is a simplicity and speed over precision. So we, we are not that uh, precise because we don't have this super sophisticated chain tracking where we track um, the bytes through every um, through every operation in the kernel. We rather let them th travel through the kernel, um, check at the end, and that's it. So that's simple because the patch of KLeak for NetBSD was definitely less than a thousand lines. I don't know exactly how many it was, and it's kind of fast. You don't have uh, you you don't know to remember slowdown. Um, and that's, that was one of our goals, and actually it, it worked, as you will see later on. So code coverage, it's a dynamic analysis approach. That's the problem with dynamic analysis, so we have to, uh, we have to cover as much as possible. You can simulate user interaction, you can use, for example, you can use testing frameworks like um, ATF tests. Um, you could use fuzzing to, to improve um, the coverage, but in the end, um, yeah, close to 100% coverage is difficult. And, but that's the problem of all the dynamic analysis pop, uh, approaches. Another thing, maybe portability across the BSD, it's not a huge issue. As we, I did a proof of concept port to FreeBSD, which, which gave some results. And I think you can do it to Apple and to Linux if you want, and to Windows, I don't know. Um, so those are the direct results, actually, um, of KLeak, and I think it's not um, complete. We found in FreeBSD, we, I ported it to FreeBSD 11.2 as a proof of concept, and Maxime implemented fully a NetBSD current. And this is like, those are more than 20 li um, leaks from everywhere, from dynamic memory, from the kernel stack. Some of them are bigger, like 900 bytes, 92. Some of them are smaller. Usually those are half of a, half of a pointer on AMD64, what we found. Um, so, and the research basically goes on. Those are the direct results that we found um, with, by using KLeak. So, um, I was told there will be soon uh, a security advisory by NetBSD um, about many leaks 
more than 15, 16. I don't know what happened um, to the FreeBSD leaks. They were fixed all, but um, uh, there's no security advisory so far. I don't know. Um, what happened was, this was kind of a cool, like a follow-up um, by the FreeBSD devs. Um, the, the, the leaks were reported, and what they did basically, they looked around in the code. Where one leak is, there may be another. So on the left-hand side, there was one leak in GetD entries, and they found <coughs> out that were like 20 in 20 implementations of file systems, there was a leak, and they fixed them all. So as a follow-up, they fixed like 50 or 60 um, more kernel memory disclosures, which was quite work. Um, Yes, so um, as, as a conclusion, so we saw what are kernel memory disclosures, so what they are, um, how to avoid them. I presented you um, our approach, which is called KLeak, which is fully implemented in NetBSD, and it detected more than 20 um, of those um, memory disclosures, and as a follow-up, dozens of those were fixed by other developers, and so it's um, a thing, the, the one, one more thing is the BSD are far from being KMD free. Um, that's true for other operating systems as well. So in, instead today, instead of planting a tree, maybe we can fix a memory disclosure and we're getting closer to a full secure system. So um, keep looking for them and thank you for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. How expensive would it be to, to zero at compile time, like have, have the compiler uh, insert zero instructions for the stack that's used by kernel functions? Excuse me, you? Could the compiler insert zero instructions for the, for the like, could you, add, uh, could you modify the comp compiler yeah. to add function entry, zero out all the, all the stack variables? Uh, essentially modifying the C language. Actually, there are some um, projects and um, like for example on Linux, there's something like that. Every time you enter into a system call, um, it will zero out your, your stack. So then there's the issue performance. So this is, those are like, I don't know how many CPU cycles, but if it's performance critical, <laughs> you, don't, you, you won't need it. You, won't, you don't want to have it, but it's, there it's not, um, it's not um, a standard thing, it's one of those security patches. I don't know how they're called, like the Linux security patches maybe. Um, yeah, but then again, there's, for example, there's, um, there are leaks that are from, um, because you wrote it there, and then there are leaks, for example, inadvertently, then there are leaks from the heap, so then you have to patch um, your heap um, implementation as well. So there are many um, places where those leaks can and could occur. Yes. What do you use as a key for the heat map? As a key? Yeah, yeah. How do you identify the entries? So this was, um, actually I'm not, the heat map was the greatest idea of Maxime who implemented it. So I asked him, that was, um, so I cannot give you the title details on the heat map. Okay. Okay. Thank you.